Welcome to After Hour. My name is Dr. John Russell, a nurse practitioner in cardiothoracic surgery, and excited to talk to you about what the life of an APRN going to the OR is. And I title this, it's a whole new world because obviously if you've been in the OR, you know what that looks like. But if you're an APRN and your role takes to the OR, it's very possible, like it was for me, that you've never set foot in the OR before. And I'd like to talk to basically whoever's interested in hearing about what that's like and basically go through some fun uh, things that will hopefully at least get you thinking about what that is a little bit different than maybe what you'd expect, things that will be useful for you as negotiating tools and some Q&A time to kind of run through uh, anything you have on your mind. I'm here for you. So first and foremost, I am a family nurse practitioner, adult geri care NP, and I'm a first assist. So I've kind of gone down all those little fun rabbit holes of education. And I work for NIFA as the APRN RNFA program director. So I work to kind of help develop some of those relationships with universities and uh, help people understand kind of what that process looks like. So if you have questions about what NIFA's program is, questions for what that transition from RN to APRN and then what APRN going to the OR is like, I'm here to be a resource for you. I'm also the owner and the CEO of Skills on Point LLC, which is a training company designed for people that are looking for all the procedural skills that go alongside with that, not the first assisting part, but let's say like the central lines and chest tubes and art lines and, and all the things that are complementary to the skill set you're going to have to have to be successful in your role in a surgical practice. So let's talk about some fun stuff. Uh, first and foremost, let's talk about the intro to the ORs and APRN. Talk a little about how your skill level can affect your employment. And what I mean by that, uh, we'll, we'll get to a little more, but basically how your training uh, prepares you or doesn't prepare you and what you can do to help satisfy those gaps, if you have any. How billing works for procedures. If you're a nurse, you probably don't really have to deal with this. So this may be something that kind of helps bring into context why you can help uh, basically justify being paid more than someone who doesn't do procedures and how assisting fits into that. We'll talk about RNFA versus APRN RNFA billing. And a little quick caveat there, if you're interested in learning more about that, just keep in mind that you can also listen to the after hour that's put on by Gary Hargreave from the NIFA Billing Company. He is an expert in all things billing. So if you have questions about billing, questions about your specific state, he's your expert to talk to, in my opinion. I am certainly not, but I'm certainly happy to answer whatever questions that I can uh, within the context of what I do know. Talk a bit about negotiating your RNFA training based on billing plans. And by billing plans, I mean basically what you intend to do as far as what your role will allow, like what you're going to be billing for. Like, are you going to be assisting or doing procedures? Are you more in the clinic or more you acute? Like wherever you're at, there's some differences I think are important to keep in context as you are negotiating for your roles. And I certainly hope you are negotiating when you take positions and not just taking what they offer you. And then Q&A time, and we'll go from there. So very quickly about me. I mentioned this just because there's plenty of people that are in my shoes and I hate talking about myself. Honestly, it's not something I'm really like doing. Uh, but that said, I, I think it's important to put myself in the spotlight here so you can kind of appreciate the similarities and where you may be coming into this from. So I was in the military until 2007 and kind of in the midst of that, I kind of got into the pre-hospital world as a paramedic, really kind of fell in love with the medical practice and a lot of the things that go with that acute environment, the high intensity, all that fun. And then uh, I got married and my wife said, hey, you should become a nurse. She was a nurse and she was right. It was an awesome career. So I went into nursing in the intensive care unit. And then I went to get my bachelor's in 2012 with the intention of going on to get an FNP. Because of course, my wife, who was an FNP at that point said, hey, you should become an FNP too. And of course, she's way smarter than I am. So I did whatever she said. And I became an FNP too. I said, yep, you're right. This is awesome. I love this. And then 2014, I went into CV surgery. And with that was the first time I ever set foot in the OR. And I guess my point of all this is, is you'll find yourself, you know, with your own version of what this looks like and your chronologic curriculum vitae or your, you know, this is my job history or whatever. My goal with this is like, you'll find very, very commonly people that are nurse practitioners have no OR experience before they go into the OR. That is okay. Don't be afraid of that. That's nothing to be worried about. There's plenty of onboarding that happens anyway. You may find it's a little bit different, but that said, there's a learning curve. You are an adult learner. You're already kind of going through the process. Don't worry about it, okay? Do not worry about it. You will be successful because you're a hard worker and you're smart. Don't worry about the other stuff. People are always people, all right? Just because someone's been for you know 30 years a circulator in the OR doesn't mean they know the first thing about first assisting. 
That is a very common misconception. You've watched it a bunch, but until you do it, I don't care what you have to say. So I went through my NIFA program as a student in 2015, about a, I think nine months, 10 months after I started in my formal job in CV surgery. And thereafter, I was kind of in the process of a DNP, started skills on point, uh, basically recognizing that I had some issues that I wanted to make easier for the next round of people coming through. It was difficult to find the training, difficult to find those resources for the privileges I needed to get. So I wanted to try to make a clearing house for that. And we've been very successful in doing that. I started a nonprofit branch off of that uh, to basically help people have access to medical education. If you're going to go to do austere condition uh, work or medical missions or service trips, I will train you for free and do all kinds of fun stuff with you and, and resource you however we can. In 2019, I became a program director for NIFA. So basically the point here is uh, you never know where your career is going to take you. You never know where your skill set is going to be valuable or who's going to value that. I would highly encourage you, if you have an opportunity to get in the OR and someone's willing to train you, take that seriously. That is a very unique thing. Very, very special. Uh, I went through the adult geriatric acute care, and I put this on here because people tend to ask, like, well, you're an FNP, you're in CV surgery. Is that okay? Hospitals where I'm at don't allow that. Or, you know, maybe it's okay where I'm at. Like, Remember, it's all a matter of the consensus model and how that's interpreted where you work. So I just felt for myself, I wanted to go through and do that. So I'm dual boarded just because I was more in acute care than family practice. But certainly, uh, you know, that's up to you where you work. I now teach full time. I'm not at the bedside. I'm not in the OR. As about a year ago, due to some family issues, my dad's health was getting a little worse and had heart surgery and had mitral clip and had dialysis and all kinds of fun things going on. So I moved out to the country too far away from where the OR is. So now I teach full-time for CRNAs, which is super fun. And a bunch of uh, type A ICU nurses that they can't possibly be wrong. So that's a blast. Uh, but I teach uh, full-time and I get to enjoy the benefits of all the things that have gotten me to this point. And my point is, you never know you're going to find yourself going. I would have told you five years ago, I would never be doing what I'm doing now. Five years before that, I'd say the same thing. So if you ever like, ah, I don't need to go get my training to be in the OR because I'll never do that. Wait five years, you look back and say, why did I ever say that? So intro to the OR is an APRN. This is what it looks like in an OR if you've never been in the OR. It's kind of like what you expect to see off of Gray's Anatomy, although it's usually a little bit more, I don't know, more scurry happening. There's all kinds of excitement in the air. You walk in, it's like your first day of residency and the you know everyone's talking and they have like, their masks on and like, what do I do here? Don't touch this, do touch this. And they're all excited. And everyone else is looking around knowing what's going on, except for you. You have no idea what to do. Where do I stand? Where do I not touch? Where do I touch? What can I do? How can I be helpful without being in the way? Everyone's watching you to make a mistake because you're going to make a mistake. You're going to break sterility. You're going to touch a handle without a light, without a sterile glove on. It's going to happen. It's just part of the process of learning. But just remember that there is competition for the seat at the table. And the reason that you're there is important. There is a reason that you would be in this role as opposed to someone else. And that competition is something I want you to not say, aha, I'm here instead of you, but appreciate that because someone saw you as a resource that could do that job. Being a first assistant is a very difficult job. There's a lot that goes into it. You have to be thinking about everyone else. You have to kind of be the superintendent of the OR, as well as troubleshooting when things go wrong. And sometimes surgeons just have a lot of attitude and personality. And you're kind of like that go-between to make things kind of calm down. Uh, at least I know I have, and it's it's very uh, draining. But that said, it's also extremely rewarding. And I think it's important to realize that you're doing something that's very, very vital. Question is, why are you here as opposed to a surge tech FA or an RNFA or a PA? And I guess the one big thing I will say is sometimes that's a billing. That's the answer is, oh, because we can bill for you or because you cost this versus them or maybe because you see the patient's pre-op also, and you can see longitudinal care or whatever it is, there's a reason that you specifically as a person were an attractive person for the surgical group to say, oh, they would be great at this. So just remember, it's easy to kick yourself and say, I'm just a student in this. Oh my gosh, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's okay, okay? They understand that, they're taking that on. They're gonna make you awesome if you keep on pushing and just keep on moving forward. The problem is you'll see a lot of people around you that are kind of like expecting you to fail and waiting for you to fail. And they want you to fail because, you know, it's easy to watch someone fail and uh, not help them. I've had plenty of those experiences. But the cool part is 
you're going to see more and more APRNs in the OR because with billing the way it is these days specifically, and we'll get into that, it's very valuable to have APRNs in the OR. In general, are there drawbacks of being in the OR? I would say the biggest ones usually come with your schedule. I think it seems pretty obvious, right? You're talking about having to have longer hours or call or the things that go along with a surgical practice, depending on what that practice is. If you really don't want to deal with the drawbacks of being on call after hours, then maybe you can go work in an area where you don't have that. I know plenty of people that work in ambulatory surgical centers, and then you don't really have to worry about that because they're closed after 5 p.m. or whatever. Whereas if you're doing like trauma surgery or ortho or CV, like, you know, three o'clock in the morning, it's business time, right? So it is what it is. Um, but that's the really only big drawback I could say is if you know your personal schedule is going to be kind of complicated. The benefits there are not just financial, but they certainly do include that. I would say you'll tend to see at least 10 to 50% higher of pay compared to someone who's a staff nurse or staff nurse practitioner that's not doing things in the procedural areas just because your reimbursement's higher, right? You're doing things that generate RVUs and CPT codes and you're assisting those and, and adding value as a second provider. So expect to see some level of repayment increase. I'd say for the generalization, it used to be $100,000 was an easy number to say if you're like in a clinic setting, you'd see 100,000. If you were in a hospital setting, you'd see 110. And if you were in the OR, you'd see about 120. Like this is like a little staggered evaluation. That's again, everything is different now. Everything is a new world when it comes to what values are and nurses are making more than that, just being bedside nurses. And not to say just, but you know what I mean? It's like, there's less risk, less all of that when it comes to your licensure, you're not actually putting in orders, you're not actually doing procedures. Maybe you have a better schedule of 312s than you would. So uh, you're seeing a lot of flex and change happening right now in repayment. Uh, I'm even seeing some hospitals talk about where they're taking away some of the money from the APRNs because they have to keep up with the pay for the nurses and it's got to come out of some pot and that's the pot it comes out of. It comes out of the, the uh, APP. So uh, your, your best bet is to make yourself uniquely valuable to be a resource for making money and that's going to be being in the OR. That's the way you stay ahead of that curve, in my opinion. How your skill levels affect your employment. So let's talk about just getting hired in 2022, shall we? What a year. What a crazy change we've had just in inflation. You think about the labor force. You think about how the new nurses you see. If I go around and see uh, nurses, I say, I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. You know, I used to know everyone by their first and last name and probably their middle name too. And now I have no idea who these people are yet. Travelers are everywhere. Like everything is just different. So I guess my point here is nothing about that is going to be changed by you becoming a nurse practitioner or going to the OR. But what you will find is specifically, this is the question that you have to answer that's unique to your environment is how do you stand out? How do you, as a nurse practitioner, that's going from, let's say from a nurse to a nurse practitioner or from a nurse practitioner already in clinical practice to a role that includes the OR, how do you stand out? And it's usually not academics. I hate to break it to you. If you got a 4.0 GPA, versus a 3.8 GPA, I don't think they really care. Quite honestly, they want to see someone who can do the job and understands how to do clinical management of patients in complex situations. That's what they're looking for. And if I was to hire a nurse practitioner, I'd be looking for somebody who didn't have a question mark over that skill set. And the best way in my mind to prepare that for someone else to say, see, I'm ready, is to make sure that you know how well you are prepared when it comes to the procedural skills, the specialty skills, anything you want for the job you're applying for. Let's say if you're going for CV surgery versus gen surgery, you may have about 50% of the things you have to know for privileging are going to be the same. Whereas let's say maybe there's those other 50% that are unique to that niche, right? But for both of them, you have to know how to suture, how to do, you know, let's say local anesthesia, small opening and closing, draping, gowning, like all the little things for the office procedures you do. But then maybe for CV surgery, you're looking more like chest tubes and pleurodesis and uh, pacer wire removal, all those little niche skills and things that are kind of useful. Central line insertion, maybe for both of them. Your school may have provided training on that. Maybe they did not. My point is that these are the things that if you have these ready to go, you're basically going to fly through credentialing. And a very important question comes to mind is which NP program covers operative medicine? And by, I should say program, I should say certification. And the answer is none of them do. Not a single one of them do because that is such a niche thing that is superseding the, the I guess you'd call it the national scope of practice 
of the by the bullet line family nurse practitioner adult care acute care np cns right those are unique certifications but they don't cover operative medicine they say that right there in the top of the national standards so what do you do how do you get to be in the or well you're not magically an or uh, surgeon you're not like doing surgery but that said if you're on the surgical team as a first assistant that's a specialty privilege you have to get more and more hospitals are requiring that you have a formalized initial training to do that and that's where NIFA comes in like looking at a program that's going to say start to finish we looked at the national guidelines these are very well uh, laid out as to what is expected for a program fewer and fewer hospitals are saying well this surgeon can just kind of train you on the job and it's going to be fine that's not really a thing anymore. It is some little small hospitals that it's not an option just because you have a small population that are interested in coming to work with you because you're geographically in a critical access area or something like that. But I will certainly say you will see the general trend is away from that and towards having a formalized piece of paper that says, I have been formally trained by a third party certifying agency that knows what's up when it comes to doing these skills. And I cannot tell you how valuable that is to have that when you want to move jobs. My wife is a great example. She's an FNP that started in ortho first assisting. And the very first surgeon she worked with uh, was reluctant to send her to NIFA when she heard about it. And so this is perfect. I want to be a first assistant. And he's like, nah, I'll just train you. You know, it's time away on vacation. You can't see patients and it costs money and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to do that. So she was basically the very first nurse practitioner in a healthcare system to be a first assistant because otherwise historically had all been PAs. So what do you do with that? You say, okay, I guess that's what we're going to do here. And long story short, she was a very successful first assistant. She did a great job in ortho surgeries. Everyone was happy with her. And the, the hospital was okay with that at the time. Since then, if she wanted to go back to doing work as a first assistant there, she would have to show evidence of completing a formalized RNFA program. What she did would no longer be sufficient. And even though she's already very capable and knows how to do it, she would have to go back to school. So my point is, it's a disruption to the continuum of care you're providing, so disruption to your life, to disruption to your financial revenue when you're working on RVUs, to talk about a little bit here. It's wise to get this done up front, is my point. So be thinking about that. If you're kind of on the fence about that, well, this doc said they'll just train me. It's like, yeah, but what, would you, what about when you want to leave that doc? What about two years from now when they adopt a new policy and then you're pigeonholed and you can't leave? Otherwise, every other hospital says you have to have that training. What else do you need to know for your position? And the best way to answer this is to talk to someone else who has done your job. When I was hired in CV surgery, I was an ICU nurse still, but I knew the surgery team. I already worked there. The uh, PA that was leaving, I had a very long conversation with him and I could look up his credentials. I could see what his privileging was. I was able to say, okay, this is what you do in an average day. What skills would you recommend I get training on? And honestly, this is where Skills on Point came out of because I had a hard time finding some of those trainings. And you can go to a big conference here and there, but the problem is those conferences aren't designed to be meat and potatoes around skills. They kind of have like a little pre-conference thing about this or that. And then they have like the main conference with maybe one little skill thing here and there. But you spend a lot of money to go to a big conference and just find like one little thing checked off, so to speak. Whereas your school probably could have or should have provided that, or maybe clinical should have or would have provided that had you had that clinical experience instead of the one you had. And there's always a story, right? There's always a reason why you didn't get to see the one that you really wanted to do. Oh, I could have done central lines with that one. Oh, I missed that day because I was here or there. The point is there's got to be an easy way to centralize it. And that's what Skills on Point does. So if you've never heard of Skills on Point, just check it out, www.skillsonpoint.com. And you can see all the courses we offer. We service tons and tons of schools. I just want to make it easier for the next group of people coming through this to have access to really high quality training. So this is something I don't care if you go to Skills on Point. Make sure your school or wherever you were trained or wherever you want to go, you, you know what you need to have before you go into that position. Because if you have that done before you go to apply, you make yourself such a stronger candidate. And that is the thing that makes you stand out, okay? You can say, I already have the skill sets to do this job. And see, it's right here on a piece of paper. I'm good to go. All I need to do is get some reps on some real patients. Let's go. They're going to take that more seriously than I'm sure you're going to train me on the job, right? I've never done central lines. I hope I don't pass out. You know, it, It's not going to be the same experience when you go to that interview. They're going to go, uh, yeah, no. How does credentialing work? I can't tell you how many people have said I had no idea that when I became a nurse practitioner, I'd have to wait like 90 days or so, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more to go through this process that's called credentialing and privileging. 
And what that is talking about is basically, okay, you're hired. Awesome. You've got the job. However, now a group of people who are uh, usually physicians, anesthesiologists, usually there's at least one person that's an advanced practice provider on that group, ideally, not always. Uh, they're going to look at your application and say, hey, you, this person wants to have hospital privileges so that they can do things like be in the OR or go around on patients or do whatever. And are they qualified? They're going to be asking questions. They're going to be looking for documentation from your either preceptors or your school or wherever. And that process can be a make it or break it. And I mentioned this because I know a lot of people are taking jobs all across the country because they're super high paying, sounds really awesome. And then you like stop your job, you go move to another place and you're like, okay, I took my boards. When do I start? They're going to say, it's going to be uh, three months from now. And you're like, wait, well, what? I've already quit my job. It's not going to be next week. I'm a nurse. I'm used to doing this where I just kind of change jobs. And a couple of days later, I'm starting. I just want to warn you, that's not how it works for nurse practitioners. It's going to take some time to get to that process. You have to go through getting your credentials with the insurance companies to be on their uh, billing plans and all of that. So it's, it's a pretty big deal uh, to get you up and going. It's not an a overnight sensation and you're good to go. Um, just be aware of that. Sometimes you can go through being hired and then you will not go through successfully in the credentialing process. And that means that you maybe you aren't going to get the job. Maybe you thought you did. And now just kidding, we've taken that offer back because you don't have the, the proper credentials. They're vetting you basically. And if you're not going to vet out properly, then you're not going to have the job. So make sure you know you're qualified at that facility to do the job. Call that medical staff office and say, hey, I'm a family nurse practitioner. Can I do this job in your facility? Hi, I'm a CNS. Can I do this job in your facility? I applied for this job that says, listen, for a PA or a nurse practitioner, I happen to be this subspecialty. Is that okay for you? And every hospital will have a different answer. And that's important to know. All right, let's talk about how billing works for procedures. This is something I did not know at all about, but I think it's useful information. So hopefully it'll kind of put it in context. So let's talk about a, a scenario. So let's say I have shoulder pain and I'm going to go see my primary care physician, NP or PA. And they're going to say, oh, you got some shoulder pain. Let's do an evaluation and management visit. And they're going to go, okay, move your arm around, do this, do that. Okay, it looks like you've got some uh, pain up there. Okay, well, I guess well, we can do this or we can do that. We can get an x-ray, blah, blah, blah. This is all a fee-for-service model. This is basically like going to get your car well, car wash, you pick which car wash you want. This is basically a level of service that's an established thing. And then we go to the next level, which is a referral to a specialty. So again, same kind of deal. Uh, who's your in-network person? Oh, I'm going to go see Dr. Green. Okay, nice to meet you, Dr. Green. Never met me before. So they're going to have this new consult charge for that visit. They're going to be say, oh my goodness, you've got all kinds of stuff in there. You tore your labrum, I think. I don't know. We're going to get some imaging and find out, but it looks like you got a problem there. Okay. All right, so both of these kind of working down the curriculum here of what could possibly be left to right here. These are just basically picking a different car wash, right? There's nothing special about these. All I'm doing is just saying one fee for service. I'm in, I'm out. There's not like a bundle of service going on yet. Okay, so then we go through insurance prior offs, denials. Uh, we have to, you know, fight those. We have to do peer to peers, all this fun stuff. We finally get our MRI to say, you know, you've had shoulder pain for enough time for uh, it's legit. Okay, and now, oh my goodness, that MRI shows you do have a labral tear. Oh my goodness, you have AC joint separation. Oh, what are we going to do? I guess we're going to do surgery. So we finally get to the point of doing surgery. And then over here in the very last column, now the procedure is approved by insurance, is scheduled, and the procedure actually occurs. This is important. If you're a nurse practitioner, this is important. The day of surgery on for procedures. So let's say you're talking about like orthoscopic surgery or let's say you have something really simple, like a cath lab procedure, it doesn't matter what it is. You're now what's called the surgical bundle. And if you're not familiar with this, get familiar with this, all right? These are a diagnosis related group of repayment. This is like saying, if you do this, I will pay you on contract for the entire thing under the assumption that now it's kind of like, you know, the whole contract of like having your, your deck wash is worth a thousand bucks. All right, well, if you use a little more water or use a little more soap or whatever, still you get a thousand bucks. Well, your machine breaks down, I don't care. You're still getting a thousand bucks. It's on you. That's literally what this is. This is a contract between the hospital and the um, insurance company for what they're going to repay you. Now, this is important because I can't tell you how commonly this bites people. For the day of surgery on for 90 days, you're in the surgical bundle in that window of time that no matter what happens, you can't bill for anything more unless you have complications. 
this is a big deal. Uh, nurse practitioners that I know that are first assistants will go from a clinical practice, let's say, uh, I know someone that's actually a NIFA trained RNFA that just left a OB practice that was a thriving practice, but she was hired under an RVU model. So RVUs are basically relative value units. So like, let's say if you go do this chore, you get a dollar. And I have little kids, so it's an easy analogy for me to think about. If I go rake some leaves, I get $5. Or if I go clean my room, I give them $2 or whatever. That's what an RVU is. The amount of work has a relative value to that. So if I see a patient in the clinic, it's a one RVU. If I want to see twice as many patients, well, I'm going to make twice as many RVUs. It's pretty simple. But as a surgical service line, you have all these patients that are kind of just in the hospital, on the ventilator, you know, taking up a bed for a couple of days. All that daily management, the rounding, everything you're doing, you can't bill for those. They're basically free charges. Like this is part of the deal. Like it's just assumed in the care of the money you've already received. And why that matters for you as the NP is, and for the example I was kind of going into was, you know, if you are working with a surgeon who's doing all the new consults, because again, on the far left of the screen over though, those are basically fee for service every single time, ka-ching, you're making your money. But you get over to the post-surgical care for that 90 days, you're not making anything. It's basically free care, which is a big deal. Your patient is going to be seen every day in the hospital, all the post-op visits, let's say you have a C-section, you're going to see all that post-op care for, you know, your incisional care, looking for any bleeding or any damage. If you had like a, um, let's say you had to have an episiotomy or, you know, whatever kind of complications you had at the procedure, those were all in the surgical bundle. And I guarantee you, you're not going to see a whole lot of the surgeon afterwards. You're going to be seeing their NP or PA. Why? Because it's not going to be very valuable for their time. They're not going to make any money for doing that unless there's a complication. So this is a big deal. Okay. You basically sign a deadline. Oh, I'll see that. I'll do this job. The expectation is 2000 RVUs, 2000 RVUs in a year, no big deal. And then all you do is instead of doing all the things that make the RVUs, you go do all the post-op visits that are free and they don't show any RVUs. And then your schedule is 40 hours plus a week of, of doing work and charting. Yet you're showing a thousand RVUs because basically the surgeon's like, ah, go do this instead. And what are you going to do? Fight them on it. And you're not going to see the RVUs. And that's a problem if that's how you're repaid. So my encouragement here is if you don't understand how this works, now you kind of do. And remember that when you're negotiating for your salary, especially for the first couple of years, I, I cannot tell you how important it is if you can to make sure there's a guarantee that you're not going to be um, hindered by the surgical volume. If the volume is low, usually they say two years you're on guarantee and then you're on RVUs. It's a pretty common thing. Uh, I would just make sure that you're kind of aware of that process so that you can say, no, I want to be salaried. I don't want to be RVU'd. I want to be salaried. I make what I make. I'll be busier. That's fine. I'm less busy. That's fine. But that's not on mine. I don't get to choose how busy CV surgery is. I get to choose, you know, when I see patients throughout the day, but I got to see all the patients on our list. If I got 25 patients, I'll see 25 patients. If I got one patient, guess what? I'm going to see one patient. That's not my fault. I'm an end service line consultant. So especially in the surgical lines, I think that's a really important thing to understand. On that note, let's talk a little about the RNFA versus the APRN RNFA billing. What's so different about that? Not a whole lot of differences, but one big thing to think about here is if you're a nurse, as opposed to a nurse practitioner, nurse billing as a first assistant is unique in every state, but a couple of rules here. You cannot bill for CMS patients in just about every situation. If it's a Medicare or Medicaid patient, which is honestly most of your adult population, uh, especially thinking about the geriatric population, those that specifically are having cardiac events, you know, those bigger surgeries that tend to have a first assistant. If you are a non-prescriber, so like if you're a surge tech FA or a RNFA, you cannot bill for those cases in most situations. I say in most situations because there's always some outliers to that, but just as a general rule, assume that's maybe the best ammunition you have as an APR and to say, why not hire me as an APR and because then I can work with you and I can bill for these patients. Whereas your nurse can't, or as an, uh, why don't you pay for me to become an APRN? Because then you can have me bill for you. I know plenty of surgeons that have wives that are nurses, and then those nurses decide that they're going to go on to get their APRN. Like, why are you getting this? So that they can bill for me. Oh, okay. It's a common answer so that they can bill for me. Um, and that's just the name of the game. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. It just is what it is. Now, a big thing here is you also can't. Uh, just kind of generalize that to say that all commercial insurers will, but most commercial insurers, so 
your Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, you know, you know like these are all the big names. They will usually cover RNFAs if it's an assistable case. And every state's different. Every nuance is different with that. Talk to your local billing to make sure you're doing this accurately. But assistable cases, you know, there's a big difference between doing a bypass surgery, which obviously needs some help, versus doing like a port removal, which you probably can do by yourself. So why are you helping and wanting to bill for a port removal? Well, maybe that person has a woody tumor. And when you do that port removal, they start bleeding out. I want some help. It makes sense. It comes down to the physician documenting that effectively and saying, hey, procedural note. Yeah, this got a little crazy. I need some hands. And then your note as a first assistant is going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm listed as assistant on file. And this is what I did during that case. And that's why I'm here. You send that off to the insurance company. They're going to say, okay, fair enough. Or maybe they say, no, nope, still don't care. We're not going to bill. That's basically up to them. But at least the surgeon sends that and you send that and then it kind of matches. Uh, and then you have a pretty good chance of that working out. Again, that's for commercial insurers, not CMS. I will also mention uh, APRNs are able to bill in all 50 states for CMS and commercial patients. So this is kind of where you add that value as an APRN, okay? But it does depend on the hospital. It does depend on the insurance company, and it does depend on how they interpret your certification. Uh, and that's something you have to talk to the hospital about specifically. If that hospital says, well, we don't do this or do that, or this insurance says, well, we don't allow this or that, you need to know that up front. That's a big deal. Okay, Blue Cross Blue Shield may say, you know, in this state, we don't let FNPs do this. We do let them there, not here. Or, you know, Aetna will say this for that. And, you know, point being is every state has their unique niche kind of deal of how they evaluate that. And a hospital specifically, their liability insurance, as well as the, the medical staff office will say, well, based off of this trend, we're not going to hire X into these positions because we know it's going to be a headache for repayment. Also, a big thing here is if you're in a teaching hospital as an APRN or a uh, RNFA and you are listed as the assistant on file and they do have residents, it's important to note that they have to say why the resident wasn't used. And that's important because the residents are basically reimbursed from the government to be part of your hospital. So the government's already kind of paid to have them getting training there and being available as like, hey, use this person. Well, why didn't you use this person? I gave you a person. Like, well, well, they weren't available. Okay, as long as you say they were not available and no residents were available and we had, you know, John, he's my first assistant on the case because no residents were available. Like, that's fine, but you have to document that if you're in a teaching hospital that has a residency. Uh, PAs, they are able to bill in all 50 states. It's a little different because they have a, a, a little bit of a delegated authority under the AMA and there's a push away from that. They're trying to get some more independence. So a lot of NPs really helped promote when uh, NPs were getting their independence uh, for a lot of states, over 26 states, I believe now have full practice authority. And I think that's really awesome. I would also say that if you're seeing PAs make this push, help support them too, because that's a really important thing because APPs provide excellent care. All right. So very briefly, let's talk about negotiating your training as an APR and RFA based on your billing plans. What does that even mean? Uh, I'll use myself as a scenario. So a year before I finished my uh, FNP program, so it was in 2013, the PA left the surgical practice that I was interested in working in, which was CV surgery at this hospital. So this is awesome. So, but I know there's about 0% chance you're going to wait a year for me to get through school. And then, you know, my chance will have been gone. They said, well, we've been looking, we haven't really found anybody. And if you're interested, you should apply. So I applied and they said, well, if maybe these last two semesters, you can do some clinicals with us in addition to your family practice time, and then we'll get you onboarded more effectively. I said, that sounds awesome. And for whatever reason, they said, yes. So that was pretty exciting. A year before I graduated, I already had my job, which I, I understand that it's not a, a normal situation, but it was unique to the environment I was in. And I knew the team and they knew me and it worked out well. But you're about to interview. So that day comes up and you're dressed up, you're ready to go, you're all excited, and you don't want to say the wrong questions. You don't want to, you know, not know what to think about things. And what I will mention here is you need to plan for your training. They know that you're a new grad. They know that you don't know any of the stuff. Assume that they don't expect you to be an expert. If they do, and it's obvious that they think that you know more than you know, you got to stop the train and say, wait a minute. Let's back this up a little bit. Just so we're on the same page, you know, let's reorient to the fact that I am brand new here. I'm going to need some time to get trained, but it's really okay to say that. It would be almost unfair 
to lead them on to the assumption that you know more than you do, right? But once you set that expectation, they can work with that. They can decide what they feel about that. Um, and that's important because this is a first date. This is just you getting to know them, them getting to know you. And if we're cool and they say, we'd like to extend an opportunity to have you come work with us. Once they say that, they've already kind of committed to a second date, right? But one of the things between first and second date is the terms. And I think that's really important. If there is going to be a second date, I want it to look like this. I want to be in the OR. And if I'm going to be in the OR, I need to be trained because you recall me saying, I have no training in the OR. So if I'm going to be the guy in the OR with you, I'm all about that, but you have to prepare me to be successful in that. So if you want to go to the next step of having a second date and me coming working with you, I need you to be bought into the idea that I don't have this training yet and you need to, you need to provide this for me. And this is what I want to do. So what I did is I, I did exactly that. I provided them all the paperwork from NIFA. I said, just so we're on the same page, this is what the program I want to go into. Uh, I think it's a, a very well-known program. It's a great product. It's going to get me really prepared for being in the OR. And they looked at the paperwork. They went through it all. And they said, okay, this looks really cool. There's all kinds of training. It was six days at the time. And wow, that's a lot of time and everything. Okay. Uh, and they basically went for it. They said, okay, cool. We'll pay for that. And that was part of what I negotiated. I didn't really get any bump in my salary or change from what they, they offered. But what they were willing to do was they were willing to waive the time for my vacation time. So they paid for that time without it cutting into my time off that I already had saved, so to speak. And they also paid for the entirety of the course, which is awesome. Because again, that was a unique thing I needed to do for that particular job. And that's the way I would approach that. I'd say, look, if you want me to do this job, this is a unique thing that I need to have to do be, to be successful in this job. I can go work in family practice. Again, I was trained as an FNP. I could go and be in family practice. And I don't need this. But if you want me to work in, excuse me, in CV surgery, I need this. So why should you worry about this during or before your interview process? I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that didn't talk about this in their interview because they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. That's like something that'll come out like, you know, on date number seven or something like, well, at that point, you've already kind of led them down the wrong pathway and they're not going to be interested in, in basically your baggage that you haven't been trained yet. And I know plenty of people that have said, oh, I just waited until I was hired. And then we discussed that they'll be fine with that. And they're like, uh, no, it's not in your contract. We're not paying for that because we're not talking about a couple bucks here. This is a week of time off. This is, you know, this is usually somewhere between five to $10,000 of an investment between the training and the time and all of that together, hotels and flights. Or, but that said, in exchange for that, like I said, you're already going to be probably making that money back over the first year, just in your base salary on the assumption you're going to be in the OR. So it's kind of like a who cares expense, but you're just going through school, right? You're just going from RN to APRN. Chances are you have school debt. You're paying for your school. You're not working as much because you have clinicals and you're busy. Now is not a great time to be throwing a bunch of money around. So the best thing that can happen is you can say, look, you don't want to pay for me. Okay, fine. What would you pay for? What kind of commitment do you need to see in exchange for this? And they're going to train you anyway if you're doing this job. So look, for two years of commitment, I'll stay and do this job in exchange for you training me in that. They'll almost always go for that because you're giving them some kind of longevity. They're not going to be trained in bounce. Even if it sucks for a couple of years, at least you get trained, at least you're in the OR and now you're hyper marketable. So that would be my way of approaching that. Remember training takes both time and money. Money is easy to jump and say, oh, it's money. Yeah, yeah. But the time is the harder part to replace. You only get so much vacation time, family time. Like it's a stressful thing already going through school. And you want to kind of like, you know, enjoy a little bit, make sure that if you say, I'm going to negotiate for something, both get the money to do the training, but also plan for that time. It's super, super important. Don't burn yourself out over anything. Okay. The, the healthcare world in general is just so burnt out anyway right now. You have to think about ways to be proactive in your mind so that you're not burning yourself out just because it's easy to do that. And then you find yourself going, I think I made a mistake. I shouldn't be doing this. I should go you know, work at limited two or something. No, don't do that. You know, you are, you are in the right spot. You're doing the right thing because you are the best person possible for this job. And that's why they're hiring you. That's why they're interested in you. You just have to get the little ducks in a row to make it sense of it. Okay. Remember they're happy to pay for this. If it means that even if they, they dock your salary a little bit to get it done for the first year and it bumps up, I mean, whatever it takes to get it, just, just make sure you don't say, I'm not going to do that and walk away from it because this will open up so many doors in your career cannot tell you how many times people told me 
just because I did this, now I'm doing this, 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 and this. It really will make a difference. Just kind of a fun little picture here. On the left, this is the uh, little mock OR that we did as a little breakout for doing some laparoscopic training at Skills on Point. Uh, left upper corner, or sorry, middle upper corner here, this is some of the BSN stuff we do, some some nice uh, high def sims we do for a lot of uh, BSN schools all across the US. We travel all over the US. We do a lot of acute care skills for some big universities and they come to us or we go to them. Some people are doing some suturing down here, some, some, some general public course and some uh, central line training with some uh, mannequins, phantoms rather, for ultrasound. And these are some future physicians on the far left here. It's kind of fun. We're teaching them how to do some fun office procedures and some suturing. And these are all soon to be uh, family physicians that are in an interest group, not sure what they wanna do quite yet. Some wanna go to surgery, some wanna go to family practice, some wanna go to rural med, and we kind of help them uh, with some support, it's kind of fun. This picture in the middle is some NIFA students out in Las Vegas learning how to do some ultrasound guided center line insertion. And we do some fun little breakouts once in a while with, together with NIFA, because again, we have a really nice partnership. Uh, we do different products that service the same community. So our goal is to try to make it convenient. And I'm currently sitting in this room right here in the far right. We can't really see that the way it's set up here, but past there, I'm sitting at a table uh, in our sim lab. This is kind of where we have about 100 plus seats. It's a pretty big room that goes back way beyond what you can see there. And we have a lot of schools that come take advantage of our sim training. So it's super, super fun way to, um, to take the bar up without having to go to a lot of different places and spend a lot of money. We want to make it so it's really centralized. Keep it simple, all expert taught and uh, give you something very unique that will prepare you for your career. So all kind of fun stuff that I wish I had when I started. So a little Q&A time, uh, a little chance for you if you have any questions, any thoughts. I'll leave this slide up here while we're chatting. But if you need to get a hold of me or any, any particular questions for me, not for the group, again, this is my info. This is my cell. Feel free to text me. I am very accessible by my cell. My cell is all over the Skills on Point website. Um, we have about over 50 instructors right now that work for us for Skills on Point. But that said, they all know that if there's a question that goes like the chat feature, everything on the website goes directly to my phone. So uh, you are going to get me if you reach out. John.Russell at APRN.com. Great way to get a hold of me if you have any questions. And just because you hung out with me tonight, I want to say thank you. If any of you are looking for uh, really high quality CE material, if you use this discount code NIFA50 on the online CE portal at Skills on Point, uh, any of those courses, as many times as you want to use it, you can half off. There's some courses that are four or $500 that are like really nice courses. You get super nice materials, uh, instruments, and like the Family Practice Skills Workshop is extremely popular. Um, that one, I mean, that's like a 200, I'm sorry, $379 course. Half off is like 189 bucks. It's like crazy deal. So if you want some good CEs, we're here for you. Uh, so once you know, you have resources. It's all NP led. Our goal is to make your life better. I think the benefit of having NIFA, as a training company to work with, you're going to find that they have really high quality instructors. If you have not yet made the decision to do the Suture Star Workshop, I highly encourage that. That's taught by Dean Parsons. He is absolutely phenomenal. He taught me how to suture. I'm left-handed and uh, I suture right-handed better now than people that have no idea that I'm a lefty. And uh, it certainly set me on a really fun career trajectory. So I cannot recommend it enough. So what questions do you have, if any? Uh, enough of me running out of my mouth. And it looks like Anne Marie is on the beach. Nice. I'm not on the beach, but um, Dr. Russell, it's so refreshing to hear your story. I have a very similar path and we can talk offline. Uh, I'm an acute care NP. I was working at a large academic center doing cardiothoracic oh. surgery, heart and lung transplant surgery. Oh. And I uh, was trying to get into the OR for a long time. I certainly had buy-in, was going on procurements with the fellows and they needed a second set of hands. And then COVID happened and a long story short, so now I'm doing trauma because that's going to be more relaxing than heart and lung yeah. cancer surgery, but, you know, um, but a couple of things. Um, so I've changed um, states a few times as an NP and is there any, um, and I'm in the um, NIFA class right now, actually in um, Houston right now, <clears throat> is there anything specifically to know, because I know all about the credentialing, it's a, it's a painful process, especially if you're changing states. So that's one thing I would let people oh, know yeah. too, is like, if you're a new NP or if you're changing states, add on another month because it just takes forever to change states. But is there anything specifically for first assist that you need to know if you're going to, I don't anticipate changing jobs right now, but if you do change states, is there anything to know? So the good thing is the only real um, stop that you're going to find 
with that is do you have a formalized initial training? And if you basically are doc trained as opposed to going through like NIFA, because you're going through NIFA, it's going to be so much easier. Like that's basically the fast pass if you want to think about it that way. You got the piece of paper that says you've been trained. It doesn't really expire, right? It's just like, here, I've been trained, done. You give that to the credentialing, they're like, oh, okay, you're good. So that's the one thing I would say is going to make life easy. The hard thing is if you don't have that. And you can say, well, show your proof of training. It's like, oh, let me get that that notebook paper out with all my sketches of all the training. that was said, check, you're done. Like, I mean, it's just, it's so hard to have that be successful. And every state's different, but they're all going to recognize NIFA. That's basically the cool thing about this is they are everywhere and they are accepted everywhere. It's kind of like your American Express for the OR, in my opinion. That's awesome. And then just two other quick questions um, and also comments. Um, the other thing is when you're uh, negotiating your salary, um, again, I've had a lot of experience in changing jobs. Um, be creative, you know, like looking at your CME. I was fortunate that they were going to pay for this class and give me time and also give CME my other institution. You know, there was no CME involved. Um, and knowing what you're worth with the PAs and the other APPs that you're going to be working with, that was a big, I was staying in the same organization and they were offering $20,000 less annually than my other, even though it was the same institution wow. just right over the border. So knowing your worth and really negotiating and being creative, um, if you can't match my salary, can you match me here? Or, and also knowing your expectations of how many patients you're going to see in clinic. And a, and a nice line that I like to use is to sort of like walk me through a typical day, a typical week. And that really will get yeah. you on how fried you're going to be and, and how crazy it's going to be um, because those practices, um, you know, you never know. My other question is um, any talk about, um, and now you're seeing, it's nice for this generation of NPs that you're seeing like NP fellowships and things like that. We never really had that when I graduated. So it's kind of like, you know, learning, drowning in the ER, trying to figure it out as you go. Um, yeah. Any talk about fellowships like for first assist or uh, with your program specifically, things like I have ATLS through the military, but I don't do it all the time. So ATLS sure. kind of like that type of specialty um, continuing education. Yeah. So anything particular. So for for NIFA sake, uh, I think you're going to find that's obviously a very niche thing for first assisting. Right. That's designed to get you the specific skill set to be in the OR all the other stuff, and I think that's kind of where it gets into the, the gray zone of knowing what the position is going to look like, or if there's any chance you'll ever want to do dot, 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 you know, fill in the blank, whatever that is. So like ATLS stuff, awesome. So like chest tube, central lines, IOs, you know, whatever. All of that stuff is right up skills on point sale. Like that's what we do, I think, in my opinion, short of doing cadaver stuff better than pretty much anyone else that I know at the scale we do it. I'm not saying that to be like a pat, pat on my own back, but we we service very large universities and we provide very small groups despite that. And we have really, really cool faculty and, and like extremely nice gear. So if there's anything you ever wanted to do as far as like, okay, I need to do a refresher on this, or, you know, I'm going from this hospital to that hospital. And although I do have a chest tube training at that one, I haven't done enough. So they don't really want to say that you're like still up on it. You got to kind of show some reproof. Oh man, we do this stuff all the time. We have people that come in from all over the country that want to do like a little one-on-one -on -one class just to brush up on those unique skills. Because yeah, if you don't use it, you do lose it. And if you don't show proof of it, you still lose it anyway. So it's like, oh, I got to do some reps on everything, especially a new hospital where you're a nobody, right? You're, you're unknown. You're just kind of in the, the shadows. But I love what you said though. That's really important that people realize like you can always negotiate things other than like everyone goes, oh, the dollars, you get used to the money. Like, I don't care what your job is. If you were, you know, let's say two years ago, if you're working as a nurse at the bedside, making 40 bucks an hour, that'd be pretty good. And now like that's chump change to the traveler who's walking in in a full, full body Gucci scrub suit. And they're like, oh, cool. I, well, well, you spent the money. You got used to that money. You don't want to go back to being like us, you know, simpletons running around and $40, it's a lot of money for nursing, right? Now it's a different world. So you get used to whatever you make. It doesn't matter if you're a CNA or a nurse or a first assist or a surgeon, you get used to a quality of life. It's all the other stuff that matters. It's all like the, the fringe benefits and like how much vacation time do you have? How well is your coverage called? You know, or how is your call covered? So like you're every third, every fourth or, you know, whatever it is. Like those are the things that really impact your family and your quality of life. And yeah, you know, it's, it becomes more important as you get older. 
last thing and I'll let go because everyone has other questions. Um, I had a, a real issue, uh, especially in my previous institution, uh, because we are in such a unique role. Um, you know, you're working with medicine colleagues and they are not, they don't understand, you know, if I'm in the OR all night, you know, out on procurement, I'm not going to be in the clinic seeing patients at 8am unless it's an emergency. So it really created this sort of tip with administration and being really um, your own advocate about what your actual job description is. So I quite literally had to rewrite and then get approved and then really knowing your team that like my, my surgeon is who I report to. Yes, I have administration, but at the end of the day, my surgeon is the person that tells me what he wants. So just kind of like, um, if you have any tips on sort of, if there's good uh, research or papers regarding the the role of an uh, APRN in the OR. Yeah, I guess the biggest thing I would say is it's unique. And despite what sounds like a great idea, it's all how that hospital is going to interpret it, right? It's all based off of how they uniquely value you. And a lot of that is going to be based by geographic um, indication. So like if you have a big PA program around an area, you're going to see a lot of PAs using that hospital and likewise for NPs and NP areas. So I think it's just a matter of knowing where you have negotiating power and where your strength is not as great. Maybe you're going to be able to say like, well, I don't have the ability to, I don't know, negotiate my position to say, if I do an overnight, then I can say, well, I'm not going to be there the next day because, you know, I, I was up all night. Um, but if you have someone else that's kind of like a built-in backup, you could say, this is a model that works, that this works in a lot of different areas, even organ procurement, that's a big deal. You have X amount of hours and there's always a backup. So once you go over 24 hours of being on call, there's always someone for your back 12 or back eight to cover you. It's just a matter of what makes the most sense and who's going to cover and how they're going to cover. I would say, no matter what you present, make sure that you give them a solution and working with management, it's always a deal of like, well, ah, one more problem. It's that, and she's got problems. Oh, no, you can say, no, I've got a problem, but here's my solution. And this is how this is going to work. And we're going to do this. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. We have to make sure that I'm taking care of, right? You know, how it goes, there's the, there's the mission and the welfare of your men. That's the military deal. So if you can say, well, we got the mission done, but my welfare is not looking so good. I've been up for 24 hours. So you're going to have to under, you get to think about what's safest for the patients that I'm taking care of. So how do we do that? Who's going to be my backup? And how can I be their backup when they're doing the cases? And um, you'll get a lot of mutual buy-in if you have surgeons that want to send a piece of paper that you put together for them. I found that tends to work a little better. It's their idea, but it was really wink, wink, your idea. And they just signed off on it. That's the best way to get things moved is a piece of paper when you're talking to people that live by pieces of paper like administration. But it sounds like you got some great ideas. It sounds like a pretty cool career path. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Other questions. These are great questions, guys. Um, Lacey says. Hey, you're good. Hi, Dr. Russell. I don't. I, I'm assuming you can hear me. Sorry, I yeah, kind of joined yeah. late. I've sat in on one of your sessions before, but cool. um, just a little quick rundown. I, I, I've been an NP for about two years. I work in acute care. I work in a cardiac ICU, and I've I've really been trying to pursue the first assisting route, but I've not really found like a good time to step out and do it. Um, I work at a little bit of a smaller hospital. I do bedside procedures, central lines, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I, I, I've done, some, I did some training first assisting in school, but haven't ever really found a good time. So I've got a couple of questions. Um, like first being, uh, like trying to find the right time. I think it's coming up soon, but then again, like you know, family stuff. I have a child coming in a couple of weeks, so it's oh, like. Congrats. Oh, thank you. Trying to like decide. I mean, I, I know from what I've heard, like financially, it, it's worth it. Like you'll recoup that money. Yeah. Um, I can use some of my CME money, but it's not going to like get close to covering, you know, sure. what I need, like everything. So I'm fine with that. I think uh, I'm in Cincinnati. So there's like, there's like seven hospital systems, but you know, there's not a lot of first assisting jobs. I really would like to do cardiothoracic surgery. Um, Mm -hmm. It won't be at my current institution because they have um, two assists, one they just hired. So that's, they're not looking for a new one. Um, So I guess my question boils down to from a financial standpoint and looking forward, um, you know, if I'm going to invest the time and the money at this point, like, you know, what do you see as far as like, 
is, you know, is it something I can re recoup fairly quickly? You know, if I don't have somebody right at the moment who says, yeah, we have a job, we're willing to take mm -hmm. you, you know, train you, all that kind of stuff. If I'm going to train, you know, on my current CME and some of my own money and then look for a position moving forward, yeah. like, like just trying to make sure that that, you know, is financially okay at this moment in time. Cause the you know, other, like I said, there's not a ton of assisting jobs. There's a couple in Columbus, but again, that's like an hour and a half for me to drive and, sure. you know, with family stuff. So that's kind of one of my first questions. I don't know what your insight is for that. I would say, uh, I'll use myself as an example. So I went through my DNP and I was like, why am I doing this? Because it's a DNP. I don't really care about this and I'll never recoup this. And, ugh, you know, this is kind of dumb. I don't use my example of my RNFA because again, it was paid for by the institution. So it's not really a fair example, but for the DNP, that was out of my own pocket. Again, I use my own CME money for that, hoping that somehow I would be able to see that turn into something, or maybe if I eventually wanted to leave the bedside or whatever, actually, I think the biggest thing is I thought that if I did that, I wouldn't have to go back to get my acute care if I was in the hospital, because maybe the DNP would kind of override that, which it doesn't, but that's just kind of a, a niche thing. Uh, in my geographical area. The first year that I was out of my DNP, I, I think I made a little over 20,000 being an adjunct professor. And that was completely unexpected. It was like, oh, you've got a DNP, you should come teach for us as a, you know, teaching some patho or teach some phys or teach some farm or teach some assessment or whatever, whatever they wanted. And I would never have known that until I was that, if that makes sense. I didn't know that that was an option because the job wasn't presented because they wouldn't have presented it knowing that I wasn't a candidate until I was a candidate. So it's kind of that like weird unknown thing where you go, oh, well, by the way, I'm a first assist. They're gonna be like, oh, wait a minute. Seriously, we need assist. Like, when are you done? Well, you know, I'm still in school. Oh, okay. You know, I guess we'll talk when you're done. But when you're already done, license in hand, you can say, yeah, I'm ready to go you can make that money back so fast. It's ridiculous. If you freelance RNFA and just do your own billing, that's a week or two weeks worth of cases that you'd make that money back for the entire program because you can bill a thousand or $2,000 for some days in cases per case because some of those are just so high repayment. Like, like spine cases are, they're crazy repayment because you're doing all kinds of stuff. It's not that it's that hard, but like anterior cervical discectomies, you can bang out a couple grand per case on those as a first assist. You just got to be your own billing company. If you work for the hospital, the hospitals can take that money. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of routes to repayment to see all that money back. Um, but if nothing else, no matter what down the road, now you're not the guy who's trying. You're the guy who's got the certification. And when the next time the job opens up, you jump on it and you're the guy. So I would say invest in yourself especially when you got little kids. I mean, I've got three little daughters. I'll tell you the best time to do it is when they're as young as possible because it's going to take time and energy and all of that. And when they get older, you're not going to care as much. You're going to want to spend your time with them. And it's just going to be extra time means more as they get older. Um, and I get it right now is an important time. I wouldn't be jumping anything right now in a couple of weeks if you're due, but you have some time for the online program, right? There's a couple months of time to get things done before you even do all those things. So I would say there's no bad time. You just, you just want to, once you start, it makes sense. Like anything else, you look back at nursing school, it wasn't probably the right time, but you just kind of dove in and it worked out. It just, it will all work out. Yeah. So uh, see, I wouldn't plan anything until probably next year, obviously once things are settled, but hmm. like moving forward, I'm looking at it. And that's, you actually kind of answered a little bit of one of my questions. Uh, like, CT surgery, at least from what I can, at my facility and most other facilities are like a hospital entity, like it's part of the hospital sure. group, but uh, like I did a rotation with first assist with neurosurgery and it's a private group. So obviously you kind of answer some of that question as far as billing goes, like you can bill yeah, way better, different, but if you're, if you're part of the hospital system, like in a, you know, some type of surgery, like CT surgery, like I might have missed it if you already when I tuned in late. How like how does billing exactly work? Is it part of the surgical package? Do you well get to bill separately at all? Or you're not going to bill separately. You're going to do a note, but the hospital has already negotiated with you as their employee yeah. what your value add is. And if you go by yourself and do a vein harvest and you do a, a cabbage times four, let's say, and you can say, well, I did all these things. Here's my cyst note. I can charge a couple thousand dollars in the very high side, let's say, as a freelance person for that. 
I make $7 at the hospital because they have a terrible negotiator working with the insurance company for how they look at that CPT code. So $7 is not really worth the time. However, yeah. that doesn't matter. That still adds more speed to the process. I can be an assist to the surgeon by putting in their post-op orders. I'm rounding, you know, I'm a value add in other ways, but that's kind of the whole point of that where you say, well, you know, yeah, yes, fine. That RNFA, you can't bill that $7 and oh, wow, you know, you build $7 for three and a half, four hours of your time. But as a freelance, you certainly can. So if you work for a private group and you go to hospitals, you'll see a lot more revenue. Yeah. So I think that uh, the kind of to go off of that, like, I, so I did neurosurgery rotation. Their RNFA is now basically phased out. He's retiring. I still have a really good relationship with him. There you go. They were hiring. I interviewed. They they went with another person with neuro experience, but she's like she does not want to assist, and they Sounds like, like have not room. filled the role. They didn't fill the role, and it doesn't sound like they're interested in that. So I don't. I'm talking to him tomorrow. So I'm I'm gonna see if maybe uh, it's if they if I can see I they might agree to take me on as like a, you know when I'm doing my training to get my my actual yeah. OR time. I'm hoping yeah. and it's maybe one thing leads to another, my man. You just say, look, I don't need the job, but would you just admit, just agree to train me? And then all of a yeah. sudden they'll say, Oh, it's kind of nice having you around here. You know, I guess we yep. you know the other person yeah. isn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, by so the way. I work in neurosurgery. Um, and my chief actually was very enthusiastic about me doing it. I'm usually in the ICU, I'm an acute care nurse practitioner. He, um, the chief has a nurse practitioner who's an RNFA and she's indispensable. Um, she adds so much value to his cases. She preps everything. Um, he, he never leaves the building, but he leaves the room and allows her to do amazing things for patients. So if you do go through with this, it's very, you are valuable in neurosurgery. Um, even as a nurse practitioner, because I know that PA is kind of like rule the roost at my hospital, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you have one surgeon that you can kind of ingratiate yourself with, you will be indispensable to them. So it's definitely, okay. especially in the neurosurgical field. Thank yeah, you our neurosurgery me. group is a group of three and our the RNFA worked with all of them. Um, so, he, so I, I think that's the case. I, I, they won't just be one person. And yeah, I think that's, they are like legitimately indispensable. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that that's kind of the path. I do like the neurosurgery route. If I had my preference, I would love CT surgery. I want to like, you know, do vein harvesting and everything like that. So, but I mean, I'm open to everything else. And if I go into neurosurgery and I get there, I'll probably love it and not leave. So I, I it is what it is, but if I had to choose, that's probably the route I would go as far as CT surgery. But we, our program, does, like the hospital I work at is coupled with a, a university who has a first assist program, mm -hmm. um, but they just don't have like the suture star stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. that's where I'm kind of hung up on some financial things at, at the moment. So I've got some decisions to make, but just really trying to seek a lot of information at this point. So yeah, yeah. thank you Great very question. much. Oh, sorry. The didactics took me a very long time because I was not a technician. So as an APRN, and you sound like that kind of route, it, it takes time. So <laughs> if you're a busy dad, yeah. like, take your time uh, with the didactics. Yep. Not easy. Sure. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. And you want to get as much out of that as possible, too, because that's kind of getting you up to speed for all the people that are in the OR that know all those things that you don't already know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions here. A couple of questions in the chat I want to get to because I know they've been sitting here and a couple of hands are up and I'll try to be quick about this. Uh, I, I appreciate all these questions. are great. Uh, any tips on trying to negotiate basically the time aspect for your training as a major priority? It's a great question. Honestly, I think the best thing that you can do in any negotiation is walk into the room and talk to the person who's in charge of the negotiation, whether it's your manager or the surgeon or whoever's kind of that person and say, if there was one thing that you are trying to solve by hiring for this position, what would it be? And ask them that they'll, they'll kind of go, wow, I never thought about that. Like, well, the one thing is with well, the last person, they're only here for a year, Ugh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, I, I really wish I had someone who could do this for me or, you know, speed up the OR time for turnover. Okay. And you respond and say, okay, 
I know you're not asking me, but the one thing that I need to make this successful so that I can satisfy what you need is the time to do this training. Can we agree that this is also important for me for that to be important for you? That's what I would say. Once they realize that it's kind of like, once they put their emotions around how important that is for them, that you're trying to solve their number one problem and that you can say, I can. And what you're saying is, I will be that person and I'm happy to do that. But now here's what I need in order to do that. I think that's probably the best negotiating tool I have. I'm not an expert negotiator, but I would certainly say that that will probably get you farther than not because you're, you're thinking like a manager at that point. You're not thinking like an employee. Uh, Diane said, intraoperative nurse, just starting the NIFA program. Cool. Uh, glad to start this. How hard is it to get licensed in Nevada? Oh boy. Good question. I have no idea. I've never been licensed in Nevada, so I couldn't speak personally to that. Uh, Kirsten State, Cole, you're currently stationed in Alaska, family in Las Vegas and want to work there, but just want to get trained there for sure. Yes. Difficult general clinical hours. Totally get that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of insight into that, but I do know some people that work in Nevada and I can ask around for you, but there's some critical care groups that I work with and do some training with out there. I will try to field some questions about what that's like. And I have actually a credentialing person in Nevada that I can ask. So I'll try to get some information. Do me a favor, send me a text at uh, 309-370-7582, like on the screen there, and uh, just say, hey, this is Diane, get back to me and I will get back to you. Renee, I'm working as a surgical assistant in cardiovascular surgery for more than eight years. Nice. Have skill in EVH and radial RE. Almost finished my APR in December with a question I need to do the not. So if you're already doing assisting and you're already knowing how to do all the procedures, I still think it's useful. Uh, but that said, that's kind of up to you. I would say you're probably going to get what you need out of the Suture Star Express if you've already been in the OR that long, the weekend course. It's a, it's a lot of the content that's in the five-day course, except for it's kind of pushed together in the three days. But I'm not going to say if you want to get more out of it, uh, that you wouldn't get enough out of the five-day. I think you'll always get the most out of the five-day. It's a way better pace to get as much as possible out of it. So my recommendation, and it was what I did at the time of the six-day, now it's a five-day. Um, I would recommend doing the five-day course. It's going to give you the options for those night electives. You'll do some more fun cases. It's just, it's a better pace, I think. Uh, if you provide a, uh, guidance on negotiating a salary increase from ob gyn NP patient to ob gyn NP patient plus versus assisting the OR, great question, Melissa. So I guess the biggest thing here, if you want to negotiate, adding it to, in addition to what you're doing is, do you want to offer an hourly rate? Do you want to have something that's going to be like a per case? Uh, are you hospital owned or is it a, a private surgical group? The, the best tool I could answer all of this would be um, MGMA data. MGMA is kind of like the, the clearinghouse of information all the hospitals send all of their, this is how many RVUs our, our people did. This is what we're paying them. This is where we are located. This is how productive they were. And it kind of gives a benchmark of what someone in certain positions will look like in their salary that's at least an objective tool. If you say, well, I want hundred bucks an hour for the cases I'm in the OR, plus I want to get 200 bucks a day for being on call or fine, throw a number in the sky. But if you can say objectively, you know, people that do this job as I'm doing it look like this, people do like this, they tend to make by statistical average in my geography, you know, Northwest, East, Central, wherever you're at, they make an additional $10,000 average based off of this productivity. That's what I would use as the best objective tool, because that's what, if you go somewhere else that offers that job, you can say, that's what they're probably going to use to, to set your salary range. That's what I use. It's called MGMA data. And to get that information, the hospital will have that information, all the credentialing and the medical staff office will have that. If you wanted to buy their annual compensation guide, it costs about $1,200. So I wouldn't go buy that. I would just go say, Hey, you know, look at your MGMA book and find out what it is. I'm curious because I think you're both going to find that I can add value to your service line, but this is what that pay reflects because I'm going to be billing. And if you can look at me, you know, make a week's up worth of the amount of RVUs that you can just imagine generating in the first assist role and what your most common procedures are, you can say, this is what you're going to bill out for me. This is how many RVUs I'm adding over what I'm doing right now. If you work in the RVU model. Um, okay. Where do you learn to bill as an APRN? Eleanor asked a great question. Um, how do you write notes, code separate from the surgeon? 
the best thing you can do is talk to your hospital biller coders because they're all going to interpret your notes a little differently. Not everyone's, you know, a supercomputer. They all kind of do it a little bit uniquely. Um, but I would say the smartest thing that you can do is have a check-in point as you're kind of getting more experience and you're doing more things. Just be like, hey, you know, I'm the new person here. I'm kind of just like, you know, play dumb. I don't know what I'm doing, but can you do me a huge favor? And just kind of go, how would you look at this note? How would you review what I did here? Did I do it right? Did I miss something? And they can help you. They want to help you because if you underbill or overbill, it can be Medicare fraud, right? So you want to make sure you're doing it right. Uh, they are probably the experts I would look at because they're going to know, one, the hospital-specific policy, the, the very unique geographical interpretation with the different insurance plans. I would not have anyone else that I'd recommend talking to other than your actual billers and coders because they want to do it right. They know how to do it right. And they're going to tell you, okay, make sure you get seven points on this or eight points of this body system. Or, you know, they can talk you through everything you need specifically. And you'll find that some insurance companies that the surgeons, the surgeons do a terrible job of documenting some of these cases. And it relies on you to kind of fill those gaps in. Otherwise, maybe they forget to even add you as the assistant on the case. Like, well, that's a problem. You kind of have to bring the surgeon in on some of those to make sure that you kind of match up on what you're doing. Um, all right. Anyone else have a quick point? I think for the sake of time, I'm imagining that um, I will probably wrap up, but I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate these questions. These are great. Anyone else have anything else they want to add quickly while we're all together? I think Melissa has her hand up. Sorry, you answered it for me. Thanks, John. <laughs> okay, all good. No worries. I don't want to get hanging there. You're sitting there. <laughs> I'm getting tired, you know. Um, thank you very much for being here tonight. I, I truly hope that this is useful information and maybe it's something you can say, you know, drink to that. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been there, but um, um, yeah, if, if any of you have questions still, I would, I would say we can certainly go offline with this. Feel free to text me. Uh, my cell is right there on the screen. Use it as a resource. I am more than happy to, uh, to chat with you or have a phone call or another Zoom session outside of here. Um, I'll, I'll hand this back over to, um, to Kevin at NIFA and certainly Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here tonight. I hope nothing but the best for you. If there's anything I can do to help be successful uh, along your path, um, please know that I'm here to make sure you have what you need to be successful. All right, thank you very much, John. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. And uh, like John said, I give you his contact information. I'm definitely feel free to hit him up. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your Tuesday night. All right, everybody. Talk to you later.